Sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dennis, and thanks for inviting us. Um, I actually uh, anticipated that exact question, and, and we'll uh, start the talk uh, with a little bit of background on where we're coming from. Um, my colleague, uh, Max Lamb, uh, will be, um, is on the, on the call and will be presenting the second half of the talk. I will be providing mostly the background and leading up to the main results that we'll be presenting. And uh, Max will take a deeper dive into the results um, that we have from our, from our GWAS. So um, I'm representing a, a consortium uh, called Cogent, which is the Cognitive Genomics Consortium. And um, this is an international consortium of uh, people interested in understanding the genetic uh, variability that uh, is associated with individual differences in general cognitive ability, as well as ultimately uh, more specific cognitive abilities. But for those of you in the audience who are not familiar with cognitive genomics uh, and the terminology, um, general cognitive ability, sometimes referred to uh, by the letter G, um, is a concept that was constructed over 100 years ago by Spearman. Um, part of the reason that he developed uh, some of the statistical innovations that he did was to understand the relationship and correlations between different cognitive abilities. So as you see represented here on the slide, um, various domains of cognitive performance, such as what he referred to as logical or reasoning, um, spatial abilities, arithmetic, mathematical abilities, um, he noticed that these tended to be correlated and that people who scored well on tests of one cognitive ability uh, also tended, generally speaking, statistically speaking, to score well on other um, domains of cognitive ability. And so uh, what he discovered and what has been replicated and, and perhaps the most well-replicated finding in all of uh, neuroscience and social science is that um, there tends to be a correlation uh, between various domains of cognitive performance, such that if you perform a principal components analysis, about 40% of the variance uh, is accounted for on the first principal component, and this uh, is called G, the general cognitive ability. Um, this ability uh, sometimes uh, is referred to also as uh, IQ. Uh, it's measured and tapped into by standard tests of IQ. But for purposes of this talk, I'll mostly be referring to it uh, as G. But uh, to, a certain, to a first approximation, those terms can be used somewhat interchangeably. Um, it, again, uh, as a longstanding observation and an extremely well-replicated observation is that G uh, tends to be quite heritable. So um, there have been countless twin studies over the last century of this phenomenon, and the heritability uh, which you see on the upper line here. I don't know if I'm going to get, yeah, I get a cursor here. Uh, the heritability tends to be in the 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 range. It tends to be stronger in adulthood than in earlier childhood. Um, I won't get into the details of why that is, but uh, suffice it to say that at least half of the variance or a bit more um, is, uh, is genetically mediated. I come to uh, this from uh, the standpoint of psychiatry and psychiatric genomics. Uh, my interest has long uh, been in the area of schizophrenia, and uh, cognitive ability has long been understood as a potential endophenotype in uh, psychiatric genomics. An endophenotype or uh, an intermediate phenotype where um, you see the manifest uh, psychiatric phenomena sort of at the surface. Deep down, um, you have uh, the genetic uh, variation, which obviously is quite distal from the uh, phenomenon of interest, and uh, is presumably mediated through uh, gene expression changes and uh, abnormalities at the level of the brain. And um, another readout of brain abnormalities is cognitive function, and it has certainly been noted again, for many decades uh, or even a century or more, uh, that schizophrenia and many other forms of mental illness are marked by significant cognitive deficits. So that's another reason that we are quite interested in this phenomenon. And in our very first uh, empirical paper 
uh, from the Cogent Consortium, uh, this is in molecular psychiatry in 2014, uh, we performed a GWAS that at the time we were quite optimistic would be well powered at about 5,000 in G in, in our cohorts, but suffice it to say that these were well phenotyped individuals, healthy individuals, uh, and we were hoping that we would see uh, some genome wide significant hits. In retrospect, uh, we're less surprised that we failed to see that, but. Um, you see the uh, rather dead Manhattan plot on the left, but what we were able to show um, on the right was a polygene overlap uh, between uh, polygene scores representing genetic uh, um, contribution to cognition and an inverse correlation with liability for schizophrenia. So that is to say that a polygene score representing higher cognitive ability was also associated with lower risk for schizophrenia in independent uh, PGC-related cohorts. Um, and, and the reverse we demonstrated as well, that uh, increased risk for schizophrenia was uh, genetically correlated in our cohort of healthy individuals with lower cognitive ability scores. Um, as I said, that, that GWAS was uh, not significant, and uh, a number of GWASs in, in that same time frame, 2014 and 2015, with increasing numbers of subjects. We had 5,000, and there was a study with 12,000 uh, from another group, and um, in the range of 20,000, Bill was coming up uh, with no genome-wide significant hits, which was uh, starting to become a source of concern. Um, Earlier this year, we published a study with 35,000 healthy individuals from 24 independent uh, cohorts. Uh, several of these had uh, multiple waves, so there were actually 35 independent substudies represented. Um, and this, again, is a very well phenotyped cohort. In Cogent, we have typically used uh, subjects that have been subjected to rather lengthy cognitive batteries with well replicated and validated cognitive measures, and we calculate uh, general cognitive ability the old-fashioned way, if you will, using a principal components analysis of multiple independent domains of cognitive ability, uh, generally requiring three independent uh, cognitive tests and corrected for age and sex and their interaction. Um, in, this, in this study uh, that was published again uh, earlier in 2017, uh, which is leading up to the study that, that uh, with our newest results, um, just to give a background on standard types of um, uh, methodological approaches that we used, we imputed the 8 million SNPs. Uh, it was dosage-based uh, GWAS. Um, most of the cohorts were unrelated individuals. There were a few sub-cohorts that involved related individuals for whom we performed both LMM uh, and performed a standard uh, meta-analysis in metal. And uh, with 35,000 subjects, we were able to get a couple of genome-wide significant hits. This was reported in January in molecular psychiatry. Uh, Joey Trampush was the first author, alongside Max Lamb, who's on, uh, on this talk. Um, but even still, at 35,000 subjects with just two uh, genome-wide significant hits and one that's in light gray there that was nearly right on the borderline of genome-wide significant, we're still well behind the curve. Uh, most of you will be familiar with this uh, famous uh, plot from Peter Fisher, demonstrating that as you increase your sample size, uh, every quantitative trait starts to um, yield genome-wide significant hits like manna from the sky. Uh, and yet at 35,000, uh, if we had an icon, it wouldn't be a triangle or a square or a circle, it would be a little unhappy face there to represent where we were falling. And again, multiple other studies uh, reported in 2016 um, and early 2017 with sample sizes in the range of 30 to 50,000 were demonstrating, again, just a few hits, uh, much lower yield than similar sample sizes for height, BMI, and even uh, more esoteric measures like uh, bone mineral density. 
So why would there be so much less GWAS success with cognitive variables as the phenotype? One reason is me measurement heterogeneity. So uh, as compared to measuring someone's height, there are each of the different cohorts used a slightly different battery um, to measure cognitive ability, and that's definitely going to contribute some noise to the signal. But these measures uh, are highly correlated. Um, different, uh, it's been well documented, and we demonstrated this in our earlier reports, that um, different ways of measuring G tend to correlate at about 0.9 or so, or better in many cases. There are issues of measurement reliability, so uh, intra-subject reliability, if somebody were to be tested for cognitive ability um, today versus tomorrow, if they're a little more tired, if they haven't had their coffee yet, and so on, can lead to some noise as well. An interesting possibility, though, that is familiar to those of you who are in the psychiatric genomics community who had to struggle through those early years of GWAS when psychiatric um, phenotypes such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder were so much farther behind in yielding GWAS hits uh, may be due to the larger mutational target. 85% of genes in the human genome are expressed in the brain, either in adulthood or uh, prenatally in fetal brain. And uh, this may just represent uh, a source of a greater range of, uh, of variability where each individual variant might contribute less uh, to the overall total. So finally, at last, um, in May of this year, just a couple of months ago, uh, there was a publication that finally crossed the threshold, if you will, uh, that was able to pull together about 78,000 subjects including UK Biobank data. Notably, the UK Biobank measure of general cognitive ability is just 13 items. It's a series of increasingly difficult questions that start basically with uh, something very close to 2 plus 2 equals blank and uh, progresses uh, in short order to very complicated logical puzzles. And using a, a large cohort uh, with a very simple measure, uh, sneakers at all, uh, and Sneakers was the first author, Danielle Postuma was the senior author coming from her lab. Uh, with 78,000 subjects, they were finally able to get a very pleasant looking Manhattan plot um, that was published in Nature Genetics in May with 16 independent risk loci and uh, that contained 39 genes um, and got, yielded some significant uh, pathway hits. Uh, using the standard pathway analysis, using uh, Go ontology, um, identifying neurodevelopment uh, gene sets as being of particular relevance to variation in cognitive ability. So what we did next uh, is the obvious thing to do for all of you who are in the GWAS community, which is meta-analyze. So we performed a metal analysis on the sneakers data combined with the cogent cohorts. There were a couple of overlapping cohorts, which we obviously uh, removed the duplication. And so now we get into the new data. Uh, that was all background. Our new data that we're presenting here, uh, the first piece of data is the um, meta-analysis, again, using metal, all standard uh, uh, GWAS techniques, uh, with a total sample size of over 100,000 now and you see the Manhattan plot on your screen, um, the, uh, the lambda uh, thousand was, was uh, just about one. The LD score intercept, again, is consistent with high polygenicity and relatively low uh, population stratification or other sources of artifact. And the overall uh, SNP heritability estimate was about uh, nearly 17% which is quite low relative to the twin-based heritability, but as you'll see, this will get larger as the, the sample size increases. But from the straight meta-analysis with 107,000 subjects, we were able to nearly double the number of loci, 28 independent risk loci uh, with 30 uh, independent uh, lead SNPs. So that means two of the loci, um, based on conditional analysis, had two uh, causal, independent causal SNPs. Um, with about 88 MAP genes uh, within them. 
And I uh, just want to note that the pathway analysis here was a little bit uh, different, gave different results from what was reported in the sneakers paper. Uh, the neurogenesis result was not significant. The neurodevelopmental uh, factors were somewhat reduced in significance, but we had uh, synaptic related properties, including uh, neuron spine and neuron projection, um, as well as the biological process of calcium dependent um, cell adhesion. And this is maybe of interest. Uh, calcium channels have been of great interest in psychiatric genomics, and uh, synaptic activity has been a, a tremendous focus of. Uh, of the gene mapping work in the realm of schizophrenia and other psychiatric disorders. But we were not satisfied with, uh, with this result. Uh, we were aware of work uh, being performed at the Broad Institute uh, that is now in press in Nature Genetics from Patrick Turley uh, uh, and Dan Benjamin uh, and uh, uh, coming out of Ben Neal's lab. Uh, and Dan Benjamin, of course, independently uh, working at USC, but collaborated on that analysis. Um, and this is a, a new technique that uh, some of you are familiar with, I'm sure, called MTAG, which is multi-trait analysis of GWAS. And what is MTAG? Well, it's a way of doing a meta-analysis when you have traits that are not necessarily uh, strictly identical uh, measures of phenotype, but somewhat related phenotypes that are highly correlated, where you may have independent cohorts, but some non-independent and overlapping cohorts. So MTAG uh, utilizes the engine of LD score regression um, to account for potential and yet unknown and uncharacterized sample overlap between multiple meta-analyzed GWAS. And in the realm of, uh, of cognitive genomics, we happen to have handy a phenotype that has been GWAST that is quite related to cognitive ability, but not quite identical, and that's the educational attainment phenotype that has now also been subjected to a series of increasing GWAS over the last four years. Again, uh, even more so than with our studies of G, the relationship between sample size and genome-wide significant hits is quite attenuated. So. Uh, the first paper in this area was over 100,000 subjects and yet yielded only one genome-wide significant hit. And this was uh, reported in Science in 2013. Um, as a proof of principle, though, that, that, the, the, that the relationship that, that may seem uh, rather obvious uh, between educational attainment and cognitive ability, we took that SNP into our cogent cohorts and reported a few years ago that that SNP was indeed significantly uh, related to co general cognitive ability in fully independent cohorts. Uh, that is to say, our coaching cohorts as compared to the, uh, the CHARGE Consortium uh, and SSBAC Social Science Consortium, where the uh, educational attainment hit had been originally discovered. Then last year, Akbe et al. published in Nature uh, a much larger report of educational attainment on about 300,000 individuals and uh, identified 74 loci. And I should backtrack for a second and just uh, remind the audience, if, if you're not familiar with these studies, that educational attainment here is simply measured as uh, the number of years of schooling that you've completed. Um, so there are many other factors, uh, both socioeconomic factors as well as uh, non-cognitive uh, potentially genetically mediated personality factors that may go into educational attainment. But we've shown, uh, uh, and with these data, um, we've taken these data and looked at it in relation to cogent, and the genetic correlation, R sub G, is uh, approximately um, 0.7. And this has been widely replicated, no matter how you slice it. All different measures of cognitive ability uh, are correlated uh, with an RG of about 0.7 or so which makes it fully appropriate for the MTAG approach. And so we applied our metal uh, data set of 107,000 individuals and uh, to boost the signal using MTAG uh, with the 300,000 subjects reported by Akbe et al. And the MTAG engine uh, gives you an output that allows you to determine what your GWAS equivalent N would be. So, this Manhattan plot 
represents uh, an equivalent GWAS of about 187,000 subjects, so a 75% boost in our uh, projected sample size for cognitive ability. Um, as you see here, the lambda and LD score intercept, again, are consistent with polygenicity, but the overall SNP heritability now is 33.6%. Uh, so a great boost and, and start. The upper bound demonstrated by uh, twin heritability because we're not capturing rare variation uh, and uh, familial, pri nearly private uh, um, variation with our SNP chip. So just to zoom in on what we're showing in this Manhattan plot, we have 70 independent genome-wide significant risk loci. Many of them uh, are doubled up on conditional analysis, um, giving us 82 independent uh, significant SNPs. And uh, within those loci, we have 267 genes. And then we also performed a magma gene-based uh, analysis. Um, as part of our uh, uh, genome, uh, as part of our GWAS pipeline, and we added uh, a number of additional genes uh, from that form of analysis. And some of our downstream analyses are based on the magma results. So we have 350 mapped genes, uh, candidate genes within our loci. Obviously, not all of them are uh, the actual relevant gene. Um, and you can see from the Venn diagram that 34 of the loci are novel. They were not reported in the educational attainment report of Akbe at all. They were not reported in the cognitive report of Sneakers at all. Obviously, there was some overlap, as you see there, uh, but 34 of the 70 loci are novel. In a moment, I'm about to pass the baton to Max Lamb to talk about the downstream analysis. There's just uh, one form of downstream analysis that, uh, that I wanted to call attention to before I hand off, which is that out of the 350 genes that are potentially implicated, um, we noted a significant overlap with genes that are known for uh, causes of Mendelian intellectual disability. And this overlap was uh, statistically significant, uh, much greater than chance. Uh, we utilized a list that was published in Nature Review Genetics uh, just about a year ago, a uh, comprehensive report, and then updated it with a more recent report uh, to get a comprehensive list of, of several hundred um, known Mendelian intellectual disability genes. And here we see that uh, a healthy number of our candidate genes emerging from our GWAS um, are given much greater uh, weight, I think, in our interpretation by the fact that uh, these same genes are, uh, have known um, mutations that, that cause uh, substantial uh, early neurodevelopmental disorders. And uh, these could be considered as representing uh, essentially an allelic series where we have alleles, uh, additive alleles identified through GWAS that cause very small effect alterations in cognitive ability, and then we have uh, more loss of function mutations and, and exonic uh, missense mutations that are known to cause either dominant or autosomal recessive forms of cognitive disorder. And so uh, I'll pause there and allow Max to talk about our further downstream analysis of our uh, genome-wide significant results, as well as our overall uh, whole genome uh, results uh, on the summary statistics. Max, take it away. Thank you, Todd. So, yes, so there was some downstream analysis that we plan to understand further the biology that underpins some of these GWAS loci that we obtained from the MTAG analysis. And these included uh, polygenic risk modeling using holdout samples from our original cogent cohort. Uh, we also performed pathway analysis, and we have chosen Magma as a platform as it's relatively quick and allows us to investigate different types of gene sets. We also conducted partitioning heritability analysis to examine differential cell type expression and epigenomic, epigenomic marks. Uh, 
transcriptomic wide analysis to integrate the EQTL profiles with the GWAS summary statistics. And finally, we also look at the genetic correlations with multiple traits that are potentially related to cognition. So moving on, uh, first we talk about the MTAG uh, analysis for polygenic risk scores uh, prediction. So Todd, would you help me advance the slides? Right. So regarding the polygenic risk model prediction, we held out the cogen samples I mentioned earlier then. And what we did was to reanalyze the MTAG analysis with just uh, education and IQ from the OCBAY and Sneaker summary statistics. What we then did was to run polygenic risk score prediction models to cognition using the IQ, education, and MTAG summary statistics respectively while correcting for the various ancestry principal components. And the results that we obtained were actually quite dramatic. So even with the already large sample sizes with the IQ and education, the increases that have been achieved from the variance explained increased substantially. So we are talking about several folds with just a two-fold increase in power for the anti summary statistics. So you see on the graphs, that with the IQ and education MTAG, the R square prediction would be much higher than the IQ only or the education only uh, summary statistics. So all the thresholds of uh, the polygenic risk scores was significant, and the most significant threshold was actually reading uh, 3.7 E minus 11, right? So moving on. So in the next couple of slides, we use the magma to dive into potential biological tissues and drug pathways that could help illuminate the GWAS findings. So uh, magma was chosen primarily for its ability to account for gene size and LD structure. And uh, some of the original simulations carried out by the authors of magma showed that uh, the genes and gene set identified did maintain the correct type one of errors. So on this slide, what we are seeing is that we are seeing the gene sets uh, from the molecular signature databases found to be significant. Two things that we can note with this pathways. The first is that uh, at face value, these are biological mechanisms that are expected to be associated with cognitive function, uh, the regulation of uh, neuronal structure. And the second is that these findings are fairly consistent with what was reported previously in the IQ and education, as well as if you see here, the neurogenesis pathways previously reported uh, also appears here, which is uh, fairly comforting. So moving on to the drug related gene set enrichment, uh, what, what is happening here is that uh, as the progress of GWAS has been fairly rapid, we are seeing uh, larger and more powered studies being reported in the literature, and the, this leads actually to the questions of how efficiently GWAS can be used to identify novel drug targets or druggable. Pathways, gene interactions. Max, your audio is cutting in and out. Can you hear me? Yes. Right. So I was talking about Gaspine Breen, and what they did was they curated several databases that allowed uh, drug interactions uh, with known drug inter interactions and allow a combination of individual drug targets into uh, drug pathways. And this can be represented by a set of genes that encode all targets of a given drug a potential novel therapeutic. This can then be entered into a standard pathway analysis software uh, like Magma, right? So, and what you're seeing on this slide is the gene set analysis that yielded evidence for uh, several calcium channel type drugs. So most notably, the strongest signal was for cinerizine, a type 
T-type calcium channel in the data typically prescribed for seasickness. And in the present study, we also separately discovered a novel association of cognition to the CACNA 1i gene, which encodes one component of the voltage-dependent T-type calcium channel gene, which is, again, similar to what we are finding here for cinerism. Uh, while cinerism has a strong antihistamic antihistamine type of activity. Uh, so these results may be inappropriate for general cognitive enhancement, but uh, further research might actually uh, look for novel agents targeting uh, the calcium channel for uh, cognitive enhancement purposes. So going on to the tissue expression profile analysis. So this Gene property analysis is yet another feature of pathway analysis, which takes uh, genes implicated in, say, tissue expression to be included as part of the pathway analysis. And here, what we are seeing is that the gene property analysis identifying brain tissue that are associated with cognition, so which makes sense to us and tells us we are probably heading in the right direction, but of course, just finding out uh, what's that the brain is associated with cognition is not so satisfying. And therefore, we employed additional downstream analysis that attempt to find what's going on in the brain. So then we look at the functional characterization of GWAR summary statistics uh, carried out via stratified audio regression to investigate if the heritability of cognitive performance is enriched in particular type of tissues or cell types. So what we did was to first put the summary statistics through a baseline partitioned heritability analysis. And after that, uh, we pass it through the cell type specific functional characterization profile that has been reported in the Funicane uh, et al. 2017 bioarchive paper. So the interesting part of this analysis is that instead of genes, it chunks the markers via SNP function as compared to the previous analysis. So the cell type characterization involved looking at uh, annotations from several databases. And here we are sharing the result from the GTEx uh, brain cells as well as epigenomic marks. And in this slide, we are seeing the results of the GTEx annotations. And once again, as with the previous analysis, we are seeing that the brain level tissues are associated with cognitive function. Now, when we move on to the next slide, what we have here is uh, interesting. So it has been hypothesized previously that white meta integrity is necessary for cognitive function. And the thinking behind that is that white matter acts as an insulation to action potential impulses and hence allow these electrical impulses to pass through more efficiently. Now, in the oligodendrocytes are actually the cells that make up white matter. So while developmental disorders primarily affecting oligodendrocytes such as uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy are marked, uh, by, marked by cognitive impairments, these results suggest actually that individual variation in cognitive ability within the normal range is actually less directly under genetic control via white matter mechanisms. Of course, the alternative hypothesis is that these effects are so small, and it requires larger samples to elucidate the, these results if they are even present. Now, the findings of the epigenomic marks are also illuminating. So as we can see, the epigenetic enrichment for feeder cells tend to be slightly stronger than those of the adult brain. So the question is, why is that so? One of the reasons that we could think of is that this analysis points to an important role for neurodevelopmental processes in uh, cognitive ability. So the res results so far point to two crucial components, molecular mechanisms involving in the wiring of the brain, if you like, uh, which takes place earlier in the neurodevelopmental process and later on in adulthood, uh, which is the neurobiological mechanisms that are also implicated in adult synaptic plasticity. And... Uh, so what's next? So next, what we did was to examine potential differential expression of related cognitive markers in uh, 
different parts of the brain. And this we use a software called MetaX Scan, which does transcriptomic wide analysis. Uh, so this allows the GTAX brain expression data to be integrated with GWAS summary statistics. So this algorithm is built on the transcriptome prediction models based on the elastic net models adjust and it also adjusts for model uncertainty and it does also LD confounding co-localization with the GWAS result as well as the EQTL profiles. So while general, generally the idea behind TWAS is to figure out potential differential expression They represent uh, topologically associated domains uh, under a three-dimensional chromatin structure, but whether uh, the effects of cognition are driven by all differentially expressed genes within such loci or if spe specific effects can be disentangled through experimental means, uh, this remains to be determined. So in the next slide, we give an example of the TWAS result of the cortex, hippocampus, and cerebellum tissue. And here we just focus on the top gene for each brain area and see that, and we can see that the results are quite intriguing. So the Amigo 3 is a protein coding gene responsible for neurite outgrowth and has been found to be involved in exonic regeneration and that's implicated in the cortex, in the hippocampus. On the uh, top right hand corner is is, uh, which is the center of the brain responsible for memory consolidation. Uh, we are seeing that uh, the DAG1 gene or the district gland 1 gene uh, implicated. And well, this is not necessarily surprising because this gene is implicated with the uh, GABAergic signaling in uh, the hippocampal neurons. And finally, we are also seeing signals coming from the cerebellum. And that I thought is uh, fairly interesting. Uh, the movement-related functions of cerebellum are robustly established in the literature, and there's emerging literature that might also implicate cognition. And here we provide evidence to link the genetics and EQTL profiles to cognitive ability. Now, the, one of the uh, top GWAS gene in this uh, uh, tissue is also the macrophage stimulating receptor 1 gene, or the MSTR1 gene, which points to a potential immune process going on that implicates cognition. So, although I should also point out that this gene appears within the cortex results as well. So the jury is still out regarding identifying dissociable uh, biological process within specific areas of the brain. I think uh, we did provide preliminary evidence to suggest that there might be just something there. So shifting gears a little, uh, we zoomed out of the brain and also asked the question regarding what other phenotypes out there also have genetic architecture related to cognitive ability. So trait one that you see here is the summary statistics entered for the MTAG results. So what I've done here is to sort the genetic correlations from uh, so that we can see at the uh, top rows and bottom rows moderately to strongly associated traits with cognition. So what we are seeing here uh, appears to be a strong developmental flavor to the results. The age of mother at first birth, how old one's parents are before passing, and also ADHD. So the earlier results that we talk about also provide context for these findings and underscores the importance of the neurodevelopmental mechanisms that underpin cognition. So now one of the other areas that we are particularly interested in is uh, schizophrenia. And when we look through the list of phenotypes that are associated with cognition, we are actually quite surprised by what we found. And we actually found that for the MTAG results, the genetic correlation with schizophrenia is actually not significant. So moving on. So what we do know clinically is that cognitive deficits are a known feature of schizophrenia. And at the same time, we also know that individuals with schizophrenia do tend to have lower education attainment compared to uh, the population. 
But with regards to the genetics, uh, moving on, right? The results that have been reported in the literature does not appear to be in sync with the clinical phenomenon that is observed. So here we, we examine the GWAS significance uh, evidence that has been uh, reported in the uh, in 2015, with the introduction of LDSC, we already then see that uh, there was a very subtle but positive relationship between uh, schizophrenia and education. So that's counterintuitive. And in the following year, with increased sample sizes from the SSGAC and UK Biobank, uh, both uh, Park Bay and Hagenes showed negative correlation with cognition and schizophrenia. And also, in the Trampush study, we show that as well. This is the study that uh, Todd mentioned earlier. But for these studies, there was also a positive correlation between uh, cognition and education, which is expected. But what is more intriguing, more intriguing is uh, despite the larger and diverse samples, the association between schizophrenia and education remains positive. And that appears counterintuitive to what was being observed in real life. So we took a look at our own data, and sure enough, it replicates what was reported in the literature. The genetic correlation with schizophrenia and cognition is about a negative 0.2, and with education on its own is about 0.1. Now, what was curious was then when we ran MTAG and looked at the genetic correlations between MTAG and schizophrenia, we see that MTAG is no longer associated with schizophrenia. Now, this we thought was something that we could dig a little further into. The results of the MTAG indicate that potentially markers associated with schizophrenia and cognition, as well as education and cognition, could be nullifying each other. So when we use a method like LDSC, it basically cancels out the genetic correlation with schizophrenia, and that seems to be what's going on here. So we ran our first round of uh, follow-up analysis, and we went by the hypothesis that there were, uh, in fact, three sets of SNPs. SNPs that were associated with cognition only, education only, and both education and cognition. So to define that, we selected SNPs that were associated with uh, particular phenotype using a nominal p-value of p less than 0.05, and we define SNPs that were unrelated to that phenotype as p greater than 10.5. So it turned out that by separating the SNPs this way, we found that the positive correlation with schizophrenia and education were driven by SNPs that were not accounted for by cognition-specific SNPs, whereas for much of the inverse correlation between schizophrenia appears to be just accounted for by cognition-specific SNPs. So taking those SNPs and doing a quick gene prioritization type analysis tells us that SNP specific to cognition appeared to be uh, associated with ion transport, ion channel, regulation type pathways, while SNPs uh, for education pointed to the cell adhesion and neuronal developmental pathways. So in the second round of analysis, we conducted a genome-wide meta-analysis between cognition and education, just so that we could extract markers that are heterogeneous between cognition and education. Now, since most market, uh, well, since most markers uh, for the, I'm sorry, so we would assume that the markers that are congruent between cognition and education uh, would not be associated with schizophrenia. And then the question was, what's going to happen if we took those incongruent markers and compared them with schizophrenia? Now, based on the first follow-up analysis, we hypothesized that the incongruent markers are likely going to be significantly associated with schizophrenia. So additionally, what we did was to also stratify the heterogeneous p-value threshold, as you can see in the graph on the slide, from uh, less than 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.1, so on and so forth, up to 0 0.001. So true enough, we see that markers that are more heterogeneous between cognition and education 
are also more likely to show a stronger correlation between schizophrenia and cognition. Now, the results suggest that it appears that it is the pure cognition markers that are going to be most related to schizophrenia. Now, the results reveal a few aspects about the potential biological mechanisms underlying cognition. So the positive association between education markers might suggest that pathway related to neurodevelopment might be implicated in schizophrenia. So it's important. At the same time, it's actually also important for education success. But in the case of schizophrenia, uh, it, it looks like too much of the good thing might be bad. Now, but at the same time, the duality of uh, the worrying and functioning aspect of neurobiology by the neurobiology is also played out in terms of the relationship between cognition and schizophrenia. We see cellular mechanisms implicated in the cognitive function being negatively associated with schizophrenia. And so uh, what we just uh, did here was actually to also look at some of the neurobiological mechanisms associated with uh, cognition. And hopefully we are seeing that these uh, results are giving us more insights when we actually superimpose them on uh, research with uh, neuropsychiatric traits, for example, schizophrenia. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand this back over to Todd for his final remarks. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, and as you can see, um, we're finally at the point after uh, many years of trying and accumulating uh, um, cohorts across the world, we have finally reached a point where cognitive genomics is able to really begin to yield some biological insights. And uh, this is obviously uh, an effort that required tremendous amounts of work uh, from many, many investigators. Um, you see them listed here. Um, and I want to acknowledge that uh, building out these cohorts required a tremendous amount of uh, resources and support from not only the NIH, but from funding agencies and private foundations um, around the United States and Europe. And um, that is an ongoing activity. In fact, uh, uh, as with uh, all areas of genomics, uh, the ability to share data has revolutionized the field. And uh, while we have published a series of studies with increasing sample size that you see listed here, um, demonstrating a variety of uh, important findings. Um, we are continuing our collaborations, uh, future collaborations uh, are ongoing, and for anyone, uh, groups that are out there uh, that are watching this talk, either uh, live or uh, on recording, um, and if you have samples that have been GWAS that are characterized for cognitive ability, um, in any way, please contact me uh, at the email that you see there, and we would love to have you uh, join this effort. Um, I anticipate that this will be uh, an area in which uh, a tremendous amount of activity is taking place in the coming uh, months and years. Thank you 